Before we get started, we just want to thank all of you guys coming today uh, for coming and wanting to learn more about Anonymous. It's a collective that all of us have had quite a bit of experience with, so we look forward to sharing that experience with you. Uh, our panel today is entitled Anonymous and the Online Fight for Justice. For those of you that aren't too familiar with Anonymous, we found this amazing four-minute quick video to kind of fill you in on Anon 101 uh, that I want to play for you. But I also want to remind you, too, that this panel is slated for two hours. So uh, just so you know, we're going to start off having the speakers give a little presentation to tell about uh, their experience with the collective. And then we're going to go into some Q&A, and we're going to have a lot of audience involvement uh, and really allow you guys to participate and ask these amazing, dynamic panelists a lot of questions. So before we get to that, here uh, is a video we want to share with you to give you a little Anon 101 to get everyone in the audience up to speed. A bunch of basement-dwelling social outcast hackers by the media. It started out as a sort of joke on 4chan, then became a trolling group with an occasional activist attitude. Some of the trollish behavior of Anon included sending unpaid pizzas to houses, DDoSing websites, posting humiliating information, and prank calls. In 2008, a private video of Tom Cruise praising Scientology made it online and was subsequently taken down by the church. This attempt of the Church of Scientology to hide the video irritated Anon, and they began a massive trolling operation against the organization. Those that had been fighting against the Church of Scientology years before came to Anon and asked them to move away from their illegal and childish trolling and move towards legitimate protesting outside the Scientology headquarters. This idea appealed to the majority of Anon, and they moved toward a legal form of protesting. Like all of the anonymous activities, they eventually got tired of this and went back to their trolling with the occasional legitimate cause. Anon got its big break around the time the governments were starting to come against WikiLeaks, which was also around the time of the Iranian uprisings. The increase in potential political causes started to move Anonymous toward more activist actions. Anyone can be a member of Anonymous. There aren't any rules or guidelines. While there are actual hackers that are members, they make up a very small portion of Anonymous. Most members are your normal, everyday people with a computer. Your grandmother, lawyer, or teacher could be a member of Anon. The Guy Fox mask that Anon is associated with comes from the comic book and subsequent movie adaptation, V for Vendetta, which is about an anarchist vigilante in futuristic Britain. Guy Fox is an actual historical figure. He attempted to blow up Parliament in 1604 in order to destabilize the British government and instate Catholic domination, which was significantly more restrictive than the government at the time. Anyway, he failed, but people still like to wear his mask. Oddly enough, the mask design is owned by Time Warner, so a percentage of the sale of each mask goes to them. Anonymous organizes its raids and communicates through 4chan and other image boards, wikis, forums, and IRC networks. While Anonymous claims to not have any leaders, it does have a form of organization and logistics that shapes it as a group. Most Anon operations are formed in the following fashion. One or two people think some fact or event is unjust and something should be done about it. They will talk to other Anon members and suggest ideas. Whether an operation will actually be launched or not mostly depends on how many Anons support the idea. No one can approve or reject an idea in Anon. If enough people like the idea, they will support it. If not, it will be ignored and dropped. There isn't a specific number of people required for an operation. Operation H.B. Gary was tackled by about half a dozen people, whereas something like Operation Tunisia involves several hundred people. Anonymous has various methods of annoying its victims. Distributed denial of service attacks, prank calls, spam emails, ordering numerous pizza deliveries to households, straight up hacking, and more. A distributed denial of service attack is when a site is visited so many times in a certain period that it can't handle all the traffic and shuts down. And non-members run a program that syncs hundreds or thousands of computers to thwart a single website at once. In the case of a non taking down the MasterCard servers, they used over 2,000 computers to DDoS the site. A DDoS attack is devastating to a company. When PayPal was brought down, millions of transactions couldn't go through, resulting in massive fees that would have to be sorted out in court. Anon has gone against the Egyptian and Iranian government, Amazon, the Motion Picture Association of America, Recording Industry Association of America, and more. Recently, they announced a plan to bring down Facebook and proclaimed that they were coming down on those distributing child pornography. Although Anon values its privacy, they have exposed quite a bit of private data owned by companies and organizations. They leaked private data owned by H.B. Geary after their owners threatened to expose Anon members, and they gave out private information of officers involved in the Occupy Wall Street arrests. Members hide their identity by faking or masking their IP address, or using a zombie computer. A zombie computer is one that has been compromised through viruses, trojans, or other malware. The virus, trojan, or malware will then make the computer send out information to target websites. 
The entire time, the owner of the zombie computer has no clue as to the activities his machine is partaking in. Afterwards, all the logs would be deleted, removing any traces of their actions. A single infected computer will then be used to infect another, and so on. While Anon still reflects its trollish 4chan origins, it has managed to move towards fighting for moral causes. Anonymous' actions are highly illegal, but the organization is often viewed favorably by advocates of free speech and internet neutrality. One thing is for sure, law enforcement will have to adapt if it ever wants to keep up with leaderless online groups like these. All right, we want to thank Jeremiah Warren for that awesome four minute real quick description on a complicated topic. And you, you guys have to uh, forgive me, I'm working on a Mac here and it's just been, it's been very hard to deal with. All right, so uh, first of all, my name's Amber Lyon and I'm an investigative journalist. I've uh, reported quite extensively on Anonymous. Um, and today we have these wonderful panelists. First of all, we have Biela Coleman. She is a professor of anthropology. We also have Grania O'Neill sitting next to her. Mercedes Hafer, Jay Lederman, and Marsha Hoffman. And if you notice, we have three lawyers on this panel and quite a few uh, females. So uh, <laughs> yeah. we're really representing here. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna go through. We just found out we only have an hour in this room, then we move to another room for a little more audience Q&A, and, and that room only fits 35 people, so we'll keep our speeches as short as possible so that we can allow more of a dynamic conversation with you guys. But uh, just to give you a little bit of my background, I am an investigative reporter. As of now, I'm an independent investigative reporter. I spent uh, two years working for CNN in their investigative and documentary unit up until last April when that unit was disbanded. I hope that uh, that didn't have to do with me. I, I don't quite know, or my anonymous reporting. Uh, so when I first started reporting on anonymous, you know, the mainstream media really had the story wrong. They were calling Anon script kitties. Uh, some people were calling them moral fags you'd hear on um, 4chan. Uh, also, uh, hackers on steroids. That was quite a popular, <laughs> quite a popular term there. Uh, but the more I got to investigating this collective, the more I realized that this perception within the mainstream media was not totally representative of everything Anonymous stands for. And the more Anons I would talk to, the more I would see more, deeper into this collective and see its power to actually uh, create tangible change. And I was overseas covering the Arab Spring and I'd have activists after activists tell me that they thanked Anonymous for actually helping galvanize and, and save their revolutions because Anonymous was able to take these videos and photos of human rights abuses and spread them across the internet and actually get the mainstream media to care about what was happening on the streets of Tunisia. Also covered Anonymous in their participation with Occupy Wall Street. Anonymous definitely served as a kind of the watchers for the protesters, outing police officers for uh, suspected police brutality incidents. In addition to that, they, uh, <laughs> I love this photo, I took this one at, at Occupy Wall Street in New York. Um, and they also really, really had a presence on the street. You would see a lot of Anon masks walking in unison uh, with the protesters. Now, one thing I noticed though, when you would look at mainstream media stories, you'd notice that a lot of the reporters didn't even talk to Anons for the story. They would just take critics' sayings and use those verbatim and, and wouldn't spend time actually getting to know the Anons. So as a journalist, one of my theories upon this is that these reporters are fearful of reporting on Anon. That's because it's a, it's a difficult story to cover. Obviously, this is a collective that says they have no leader, so you really have no one to go to to find sources as well as to go to to confirm your facts. Another thing too, you all know, the media gets played a lot as journalists. We have a megaphone to the world, so we become quite suspect. Uh, we become magnets, I guess, for trolls, for feds potentially wanting to use us to get stories out. Also, you know, we are constantly at the risk in dealing with Anonymous of publishing an incredible story, or on the other hand, uh, becoming the brunt of incredible lulls. And another thing I noticed with the reporting of Anonymous is that fear 
is not the only factor keeping the press from getting the story right. There's other forces at work that are just as, if not more, disturbing. So this is something that I, I hope everyone, it's not talked about enough in journalism, and that's the fact that right now the Obama administration is uh, waging a war, as many critics will call it, against journalists and whistleblowers, and I experienced this firsthand in, in different policies that were set in my reporting, especially in dealing with anonymous. Um, the administration, what they've been doing is they've been prosecuting whistleblowers and journalists under the Espionage Act of 1917. Now, to put things into perspective, before the Obama administration, the act had been used only three times total since 1917, and now the administration has already used it six times, six times, to go after journalists and whistleblowers. Uh, one of those journalists being a well-known New York Times reporter. Now, as an ethical journalist, I'm not going to give up my sources. I don't care. I'll go to jail. I will not reveal my sources. And that essentially has... Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so you guys all are clapping, but do you know to this administration that makes me a criminal? And I know we have <laughs> and unhireable. And, and I know we have a lot of feds in this audience, so I'm I'm gonna tell you right now I am a, a criminal in the eyes of this administration. But you know what? I'm damn proud of it because I feel like we have such an important job as journalists right now and we should start standing up and raising more awareness about, about what's going on. So, so this is how this has affected anonymous reporting is that the administration has shown major media corporations that they're not scared to go after what was once the sacred press. And, and this really extends beyond having sources that are just leaking information. It's created a chilling effect to even dealing with sensitive sources and our ability to talk to individuals like Anons and get their side of the story. I was told by my superiors that I had to ask for permission to even communicate with Anonymous. At that point, my bosses would conduct what they considered to be a risk assessment of that particular source. So whether I was allowed to interview that source became more of a business decision than an evaluation of societal good or journalistic responsibility. In other words, when you're dealing with sensitive sources who could potentially be wanted by the government, that makes the story a lot more expensive when you're evaluating the potential costs because I said I would not give up my sources. That told my bosses that we would potentially have to go to court to fight it, which you guys know how much lawyers cost. So, so that really was a consideration, uh, as these lawyers We're would free. know. Yeah. Jay, what, what would you say Mine about that is one? Pro bono. We're often free. Would well, these like lawyers are, lawyer? yeah. <laughs> so, so, so this being said, several of my investigations that would have given Anons an opportunity to tell their side of the story were killed before they even started. And that's just my experience. You can imagine how much, how widespread this is among corporate media outlets. Uh, you know, for example, in February of this year, I wanted to interview this Anon. I don't know if you guys, if anyone knows who this is. Jay knows him quite well. He's a, he's a client of Jay's. Um, and, and he goes by the name Commander X. Uh, his real name's Christopher Doyen. My bosses deemed it too risky, and they told me I could not go and talk to him to get his side of the story, mostly because it was too risky because he's facing federal charges. New York Times reporter James Risen, who's currently facing an Obama administration subpoena, said it best. And I want you guys to hear this quote. He said, can you have a democracy without aggressive investigative journalism? I don't believe you can, and that's why I'm fighting. Well, I also fought back. And when my bosses told me I couldn't go talk to them, I said, okay, well, then I'm taking vacation. I'm going to go talk to him anyway. So I did, and I'm in the process of producing an independent documentary on his life and really giving him a chance to tell his side of the story, which is what I hope all journalists and all citizens encourage journalists to do so that we all know how dangerous it is when we allow the government to tell us who our enemies are rather than the people actually finding out the truth and allowing journalists to expose that. So I, I think more than anything is that if we're able to retake back our status as journalists and as watchdogs, 
then we'll be able to tell the story of Anonymous better, and we won't get criticized so much for getting it wrong. I want to go ahead and give these panelists a chance to talk because each one of them has a very unique experience within the collective and an amazing perspective to share with you. So we're going to start first with Professor Biela Coleman. So hello everyone, I've been studying anonymous for better or for worse for about three years now and I'm going to start with one of my favorite old school anonymous videos. Dear Fox News, it has come to our unfortunate attention that both the name and nature of Anonymous has been ravaged, as if it were a whore in a back alley, and then placed on display for the public eye to behold. Allow me to say quite simply, you completely missed the point of who and what we are. Unfortunately for you, this is not some secret club where we gather in the clubhouse, swapping old porn magazines and daddy's editor clear. This is not some internet gang of panel nerds who will spend everything attempting to break into your computer. This is not some group of desperate and depraved individuals who are looking to ruin everyone else's lives because their own are pathetic. We are what you, deep down inside, want to do to your wife when she doesn't make you dinner when you come home. We are what you, deep down inside, want to be when you find your 14-year-old daughter sleeping with her 27-year-old boyfriend. We are what you, deep down inside, wish you could be when your wife cheats on you, when your son hates you, when your daughter leaves you, when the waiter spills wine on you, when your boss ridicules you. We are what you could never be. We are everyone and we are no one. We are anonymous. We are legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. We are the face of chaos and the harbingers of judgment. What? <laughs> Derp, what is the internet? So I just like that video because that was uh, a response to Fox News' story when they described them as, you know, hackers on steroids. And they're like, we're the harbingers of judgment, the face of chaos. So you can really imagine the surprise when six months after this video is released, Anonymous doesn't simply become a trolling machine, but becomes irreverent activism as well. And this is when I decided to jump in. And as the video we saw originally that opened this panel uh, talked about, Scientology um, <laughs> was the first kind of political campaign, right? And although they moved away from trolling, they still sort of retained some of the lulzy, irreverent, transgressive tactics of trolling into their activism. Now, what was kind of interesting was that between 2008 and 2010, you basically still have trolling rolling out of 4chan, some people really upset that there's any kind of activist orientation, and then you have Project Chinology. There were some sort of small operations that started, such as Operation Titstorm, to kind of protest the Australian government, censorship, and so on and so forth. And it was actually in 2010, um, that slide's missing, in 2010 with Operation Payback, uh, where a new node, a new network was born that was eventually known as Anon Ops. And this is significant because in some ways what is distinctive about Anonymous, and, and the first video was actually kind of wrong about this, is that Anonymous doesn't go from X, Y, and Z. It is that there's X, Y, and Z at the very same time. And this is something really important to emphasize. Project Chinology, in fact, continues today, right? It just happens to be that usually one network um, or one set of operations, such as the hacking operations, becomes the face of Anonymous because of the media attention given. So that's some, one point I really want to hammer down. It is a kind of multiplicity. It's not amorphousness. OK. In the most general terms, I guess you can say that uh, the lesson to heed from Anonymous is that the internet will judge the actions of individuals, corporations, and governments. It will often do it at the drop of a hat, unpredictably. 
Um, and so this is a sort of general way to understand the political operations. But now I just want to sort of emphasize uh, some particular points about the political networks. Again, I want to say it is not an amorphous blob. It's a multiplicity that is highly dynamic, and that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to study. There's regional networks, there's international networks. A network will come and go, and this is one of the reasons why it's difficult to pin down, but it's not quite as amorphous as the media often portrays it to be. Um, they take on many different causes, from environmental causes to Occupy, but the largest kind of operations often have to do with internet censorship. Those are when you get like the real, real numbers. Another sort of point that I want to emphasize is that um, the iconography and the ethics are often the same across these different nodes or networks. So the Guy Fox mask, the headless suit um, are quite similar. There's innovation, of course. Another really shared, shared principle has to do with an anti-celebrity uh, ethic within Anonymous, and I'll go back to this, but this is kind of core across the different activist networks. Um, what is different are the political tactics. So Chinology doesn't use hacking, it doesn't use DDoSing. Uh, Anonops, obviously that was their kind of preferred weapon of choice for many years. Uh, Voxanon, which is a recent um, network, actually came up with a constitution to delimit the technical power of elites. So the political tactics and the political cultures of these different networks are distinct. But perhaps something else which unites them um, has to do with the fact that they put on a really good show. Their art is spectacle, whether it's through propaganda, PR, hacking, um, a lot of great videos and iconography. This is something, again, that's often shared by the different, different political networks. And this is important because what this means is that Anonymous, like that initial video showed, is not simply just hackers, that's a small fraction. It actually allows a whole lot of people with different sorts of skills to kind of jump on board and participate. All it takes to become Anonymous is to sort of self-identify. Um, and obviously certain skills, whether they're technical skills or kind of digital skills with design and art, are quite handy. But obviously, 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 uh, LulSec and Antisec, two hacker groups who are really the same but rebranded in different ways, were quite important in the history of Anonymous. And I just want to finish with one point about them. So LulSec in some ways is quite interesting because individuals involved were quite involved in anonops, but they were a kind of secret wing. They knew that it was good to kind of do their work under the radar. They didn't want to get the attention of the media, and also they knew that it was best not to call attention to themselves as individuals. Emboldened by the HB Gary hack, Lulsec broke away and went on its 50-day kind of crazy hack for the lulls. Um, they retired and rebranded themselves as Antisec, which became uh, a bit more militant in its tone and language, right? And one of the most interesting things within the trenches of Anonymous, um, at least from my perspective as I was doing work with them, was that on the one hand, they were politically valued. And why were they politically valued? Well, they were valued because they were exposing the sorry state of security on the internet. So people were kind of happy about that. Um, there was a lot of hope, especially, especially with the anti sec that they would continue doing the leaking that WikiLeaks had been doing in the past, but they sort of went defunct. So there was the hope that they would reveal politically worthwhile or damning information. So people admired them or at minimum tolerated them. But what was the problem with anti sec and LulSec? Well, they were leader fags. They called way, way, way too much attention to the group um, or individuals within these groups such as Topiary and Sabu became celebrities on Twitter and then of course the media was giving them a whole lot of attention. So they became the status seekers that Anonymous otherwise fucking like hated. And so there was this big tension between, again, we want you to do something politically worthwhile, but ethically you're violating our core, core ethic. So we know um, in March 6, 2012, Sabu uh, was revealed as an FBI in informant. It was the big sabotage. 
Um, and since that time, you know, hacking still occurs within Anonymous. There have been some new hacker groups, but generally individuals within them have kind of stepped away from the limelight to not draw attention to themselves. I don't know what will happen next, but I just do think it's important to emphasize that Anonymous is a multiplicity where hacking is one weapon among many. Um, and again, it's not quite an amorphous blob, but it is quite difficult to, t to track of because it's kind of like a hydra with many, many different tentacles. So with that, I will pass it over to, to Grania. Thank you. We are running very low on time, so I'm gonna be really, really quick. But um, my name is Grania O'Neill, and I'm a defense attorney, and I'm a member of the National Lawyers Guild, which is a membership organization of radical and progressive lawyers throughout the country, and we have international affiliates. And when, in December, I was listening to the very exciting uh, Operation Payback in a snowy apartment, um, I thought, wow, this is so awesome. And then midway through, I thought, shit, these kids are really going to need lawyers. <laughs> And so the National Lawyers Guild, we got together and we decided to create a non-LG. And what we hope to do and what we, we continue to hope to do is to provide people with legal assistance at the moment when they're either followed or searched or approached or arrested. And so that you can call our hotline or approach us via Twitter or on our email and say like, hey, we need a lawyer, I'm in Alaska. And we can kind of go through our, our NLG Rolodex and find radical lawyers in Alaska. So, that's our goal, and kind of to bring in like how I'm thinking about anonymous, I'm not an anonymous expert like Biella, but um, how I think of it is as part of kind of a continuing thread of liberation movements. And people you know, will say, no, but how can that be? They're, they're unique and on the internet and lulzy. And if you look back through any movement, um, at the time, it was never as clearly defined as we define it today. So at the time, all movements start out rough, and then with hindsight, when they've achieved some of their goals, we can look back and say, oh, that movement was the civil rights movement, or that movement was the free speech movement. And so Anonymous is evolving and will continue to evolve, but it, it's important to not be overly critical, I think, of it, and to distance it from other liberation movements. So I wanted to say that, like Biala said, um, Anonymous is dichotomous, like it's good and bad all mixed together, and we often think about how can they be so good and how can they be so bad at once. And you know, the thing is, is that's the truth for all people. All people are good and bad at the same time. And that's dialectical, that's Freudian. You know, we learned this 100 years ago. It's not unique to Anonymous. But the law totally disagrees with my analysis here. <laughs> Their mandate is keeping the status quo. And so what they do is they repress groups that try to change the status quo. And that's what we're seeing with what the National Lawyers Guild calls the nerd scare. Um, <laughs> so I guess one of the things I hope to talk about tonight a little bit, I know we have like 10 more minutes, but is um, kind of comparing Anonymous and its movement to different rep other groups and how they were repressed and how some of the things that we saw with Sabu, we could have seen if we were looking to other movements and saw their infiltrators and informants. Okay, thanks. Next up is Mercedes. That's me. No, um, <laughs> yeah. um, so my section is sort of over. We've been told not to talk too long because Biela had a really important section and it really needed the time. So my sort of area is over the difference in prosecution between uh, like civil disobedience and online civil disobedience. So uh, everything is online now and when you protest that, that's a felony, but if you protest something offline, it's like $200 ticket and a night in jail. So that's an issue because you're sort of arresting all these really awesome, young, politically involved people that deserve to be parts of society, deserve more to be parts of society than anyone else, and you're sort of throwing them in jail for 15 years until they're 35. So um, that's my section. And I have another side. What was the other side? Is it? Ta-da! 
If you know what that is, congratulations. Welcome. Uh, and I think that's it. Oh, yeah, I, did I introduce myself? I've had a lot of shots. Oh, um, I am currently charged with conspiracy to denial of service, which I find really amusing because I want you to turn to the person next to you and punch them in the face. And very few of you are actually going to do that, but now I'm going to be charged with telling you to do it. <laughs> All right, I'm done. How do you follow that? You don't. <laughs> you don't. All right, I'm. Tell them to show tits. No. <laughs> Come on! Uh, uh, this is a majority panel. I bet the most panel. awesome, mostly female panel ever in the history of DEF CON. We had to have one man on it, or they wouldn't let us have it. So complain to right. DEF CON at the lack of tits. <laughs> All right. So I'm happy to be the lack of tits here. My name is Jay Lederman, <laughs> and I am a trial attorney. I practically live in court, and, uh, and um, I do all manner of cases. And when I saw what was kind of going on politically, when I started following the news accounts, started getting on Twitter, I said exactly the same thing that Grania said. I said, holy shit, someone's going to need a lawyer here, and someone's not going to be able to pay for it. So um, I took out my Twitter account and I tweeted at my 17 followers and I told them, hey, look, any, any hacktivist busted in my hood, righteous hacktivist busted in my hood, I will represent. So thankfully, one of my 17 followers was able to say, look, that's not how you do it. You know, rewrote the tweets for me, sent it back, and I sent them out. And actually, they seemed to make the rounds. And I had a whole lot of replies and a whole lot of emails, including one the next morning from that gentleman, Commander X. Um, he was subsequently indicted for, of all things, a very small DDoS on the county of Santa Cruz uh, in retaliation supposedly for uh, protests over homelessness there, homeless, bad homeless laws. Um, but that was sort of my entree into a larger world of kind of um, talking to Anons. I don't go into the IRC, but I am reasonably active on Twitter. I have slightly more than 17 followers now. Um, and, uh, you know, I sort of got adopted by a number of Anons as their attorney. Now, I'm not quite sure in my mind that I'm their attorney, but I'm sure they're sure in their mind that I'm their attorney. I, I, don't, rec I, I don't recall anyone having ever paid me, but that's all right. <laughs> um, we do this because it's interesting to us, because political, and because we think it's important. Um, a number of people have come up sort of on their own, and everyone thinks they're terribly clever when they do it, have called me the Tom Hagen of Anonymous. I am not. Please don't call me that. It's just not, it, it's just not accurate. Um, but I do tend to have uh, a good deal of, of attorney-client-like relationships with Anons. And I'm, I'm not trying to excuse their behavior. I'm not trying to... Uh, I'm not trying to put a happy face on any type of criminal behavior, but I am making certain arguments, including uh, one that I've made very loudly in the press, which is that under certain circumstances, and this may horrify a lot of the security people, under certain circumstances, DDoS is protected political speech and should be afforded First Amendment protections. Um, in Germany, under certain conditions. So as you heard from, uh, or maybe you didn't hear from Amber, um, Commander X was nice enough to uh, flee the jurisdiction during the middle of our prosecution. So I never did get a chance to flesh out that argument. If one of you guys wants to do a political DDoS attack, let me know, and we'll, we'll advance it. We can always use a good test case. Um, <laughs> well, you don't mind. It's only, look, it, again, it, a re in real life protest, you know, trespassing, you know, in California where I'm from, $250 fine, probably maybe a couple hours community service. Online, 10 years, $250,000. You can handle that, can't you? Can't you? Well, yeah, if they throw on the conspiracy, that's an extra five years and $500,000. Um, but uh, I, I really do want, want this crowd to conceive of the notion that DDoS may be more than just a, an annoying little, little thing that 
ultimately serves nothing. It, it may be a valid form of protest. It may be, as we say, no different than the civil rights movement in the 60s than African Americans taking up space at the Woolworths lunch counter and saying, if you will serve me lunch, I will eat it, I will pay for it, and I will leave. But if you will not serve me lunch, I will stay here until you change your policies. And that's what we see in some regards DDoS being. Thanks. Hello there. I'm Marsha Hoffman. I'm a senior staff attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So my organization, as many, if not all of you know, uh, supports digital civil liberties. And uh, we are an activist organization, and we're also a public interest law firm. So we've been watching uh, the anonymous movement with great interest because um, you know, it touches upon um, a couple of, of areas that, that we're in, incredibly um, interested in. The first being, um, of course, um, online activism, and the second being um, uh, the hacking laws, the computer intrusion laws. And um, you know, I want to pick up on um, some of the threads that Mercedes and, 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 and Jay put out there, um, which is, First and foremost, a lot of people participate in this movement because they see it as uh, being um, a way to participate in political activism um, and a form of civil disobedience. And one of the things that, that is scary about that from our perspective is that um, there is a big difference between civil disobedience in the offline world and in the online world. And the reason that that is is because um, the computer intrusion laws carry these incredible penalties. Um, you know, we're not talking about spending a night in jail. Um, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is the, the federal hacking law, and um, the provision of it that I think would, would most likely apply to a, a DDoS situation um, basically says that it's illegal to knowingly cause the transmission of a program, information, code, or command, and as a result of doing that, intentionally causing damage without authorization. Now, damage. Um, has a very particular definition which is incredibly broad. It means any impairment to the integrity or availability of data, a program, a system, or information. And, you know, if you do that, the penalties for a first time offense can be up to 10 years in jail, sorry, in prison. Um, and, you know, for more severe uh, uh, attacks like that, um, it could be even up to life. And so it's an incredibly harsh. Um, penalty and you know it, it, it's very concerning to think about young people who are you know starting to, to flex their political muscle and really want to take part in a movement you know facing up to 10 years in, in prison for a first-time offense and um, something that makes it even more uh, concerning is the fact that there are efforts underway to try to actually increase those penalties as if they're not crazy enough um, there are legislative proposals out there right now that, for, for example, would um, treat conspiracy um, as having the same maximum penalty as a completed offense. It would make the penalties for first-time offenses the same as the maximum penalties for repeat offenses, so that for a DDoS-type offense, first-time offense would be 20, up to 20 years in prison. Um, it would increase maximum penalties. And um, for the first time ever, it would add a mandatory minimum uh, of three years in prison uh, for hacking-related uh, intrusions involving critical infrastructure computers. And um, we've been working for a, hard, for a long time to try to push back against the, the CFAA. We think it's a very problematic law on many levels. We think certain provisions of it are probably unconstitutional. And we are very, very concerned about, thank you. And we think that trying to actually enhance the penalties in this way is an incredibly counterproductive thing and we'll be fighting back against that too. Thank you. All right, so I'm sure a lot of you guys out there have some questions for these panelists. So rather than uh, me asking them, I want to invite anyone from the audience to uh, come up to one of these microphones and, and we'll go ahead and try to, uh... anyone? All right, here we go. Come at me, bro. <laughs> hey. 
in a moment. Um, I'm from Mexico, and at the beginning of the year, uh, we were having a big war on drugs at this point. At the beginning of the year, there was a big movement of Anonymous. They offered to um, throw away or show or public, uh, well, publicly um, put outside in the internet all the information of the corrupt officials or people that were working um, with drug dealers. At that point, um, it was a big commotion. Uh, a lot of people in the government were hoping for that. Also, people on the drug side were, work, were um, um, waiting for that. The idea was if they throw that away and they uh, show that to the public, a lot of people would die the next night. <clears throat> Anonymous came back on it, then again went for it, and in the end, they did not public anything. So I would like to hear your thoughts, uh, especially on the ethics side about all this. So wait, just to clarify, you were talking about Op Cartel, right? I think it is there. Yeah. Um, without getting into too many specifics and a kind of long history about it, it's a good example because one of the things about Anonymous for better or for worse is that it's highly experimental, which is like people sort of get an idea on the fly and they're like, hey, let's go for it, you know, and they, they rear forward without having like a really good plan as to what they're doing and how they're doing it, right? Um, and then it's sort of after a couple of iterations of something, they kind of work it out um, slightly better. And I do think, again, there's some sort of uh, benefits and downsides of having this highly reactive and experimental method where they're just like reacting to world events. Um, the, the kind of plus side is that they just are really, they've got their finger on the pulse of world events. They're willing to jump in in a way that kind of other groups are not willing to do so. It's highly dynamic. But then in other instances, it also shows the kind of downsides because oftentimes they're not quite prepared to really tackle the nature of the problem. And so Op Cartel in some ways is a perfect example of that kind of experimental tactic that's at the heart of some uh, political operations behind Anonymous. Jay? Yeah, I, I, I think, first of all, I agree with her. I, I agree with Biela about what she's saying about our cartel, but moreover, it, it gave you a good, a good bird's eye into the dichotomies within Anonymous, because that was one of the most divisive ops that I can remember. There were people that were staunchly behind it, and there were many more, in fact, probably the majority, were very against it. And there was a recognition that people could get really hurt really seriously hurt, and people could potentially even die through this. And there was a conversation, there was a dialogue about it that was, well, it, is that a reasonable price to pay for transparent government and for an end to this type of corruption? And then there was a further dialogue with, who are you to think this would end any type of corruption or that it would even achieve those, those ends? So I'm trying not to, to take a position. I, I didn't really, I, I didn't, really get too into studying what was going on, but those were the essential, that was the essential framework of what was there. And ultimately, I think they made the, the right call in not releasing what they, they claimed to have. Um, hello. Hi, I would have to say, <clears throat> from an observer's point of view, that there's a lot of times where people will start an op with the, intended, with the intention of trying to do something and then someone will jump the gun and make a flyer and say, we're gonna fucking do it. And then later on, everyone sort of realized that sometimes it's not always possible with the people that you have around or with the time that people have with real lives and girlfriends and jobs and things. I don't have any of those, so I don't know. And, <laughs> and so I would say that sometimes that because there's no leader, because there's no formal observation or guidelines, ethics, morals, regulation, that sometimes things don't always work out the way that the media thinks they're going to or that even the people making like flyers or PR think they're going to. So people are shouting, we're gonna try and do it. And someone says, they're gonna fucking do it. And then it doesn't happen because it's not actually possible or feasible at that time. So a lot of 
things happen like that. So uh, we're going to take down this, and it doesn't happen. So. All right. Thank you for the great question. We'll. Uh... I love your shirt. <laughs> thank you. Um, kind of actually following up on that, um, with the way that Anonymous and other groups using hacktivism and uh, the advent of the internet and the ability to spread information that way, um, you actually see that it behaves similarly to how the democratic process is meant to behave. Um, my question is actually, do you believe that one, uh, that's actually a good way to do it and that we're moving in a positive direction with this, you know, especially following up with what she said where there are times when you say, you know, hey, we're going to do this and then it falls through and obviously that brings, uh, brings down anyone, everyone's support and belief in the system. But with the ability for commoners to have more of a voice and be able to spread it across um, without, you know, as much censorship or, you know, the, the indirectness of the voting system where you don't necessarily get to pr uh, present your point, you just give the yes, no, I agree or I don't agree. Um, do, do you think that we're actually moving in a positive direction and this is the right way to start looking at, A, is there a good way to make some more structure around this where it's a little bit more controlled than just a bunch of people, you know, banging on their computers and hoping it works? C cloudy the future is. <laughs> Difficult to see. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that comment is actually really That's funny because answer. I hung up a sign once uh, in Air Force Base uh, out in front of a, a warehouse that said, these are not the drones you were looking for. <laughs> nice. But it wasn't vandalism because it was removable. Um, <laughs> anyway, in uh, response to your question, I think that there's a lot of things that go amiss in the democracy that we show in a lot of our governments and that I think it's really nice and really beautiful to just have been able to observe this not even an organization but just like a, a subculture that views everyone as equal or even like skill based like if you can do a flyer you're the flyer guy and you're that guy and like you're valued for that position, or if you're the person that's really good mm -hmm. at like getting the media involved, you're the media guy and you're valued as that person. Like you're valued and everyone has a skill set and everyone is good at something. Every single one of you are good at something, if only socialing drone like goons to let you into the conference. So you have a skill set and to see a subculture arise that values everyone for what they're good at when you see ever, like in real life where you're only as good as your money or you're only as good as the job that you can do and get paid for, it's amazing to see something coming forward. And even if Anonymous dies, even if this goes away and no one ever reads about it, that idea still resonates and you can see it joining the mainstream. You can see people starting to start things like this. And it's, it's been amazing to watch it just ripple. You didn't hit me, awesome. <laughs> I thought about it. Um, <laughs> I guess um, kind of in response to your question, it's pretty clear that our democratic system or our representative de democratic system is pretty broken right now. There's about three million people in prison. Um, most of them are people of color. And most of them are in prison for possession of drugs or something like that, um, things that aren't really crimes. There's not even a victim. And, um, you know, when we're talking about Mexico, that's a drug war that's created by the U.S. government and the Mexican government, and that so many people have been killed in that, in that drug war. And, um, you know, and, it, and, and I think, I mean, I'm not, you know, the expert on this, but I saw this uh, PBS kind of uh, chart about who was voting for SOPA and who was voting against SOPA and which co campaign contributions, who they were getting their campaign contributions from. And it was really shocking. It was like people who got money from the media industry uh, vote, were voting for SOPA, people who got money from the tech industry were voting against it. You know, it's, it's broken. And um, I'm, that's not to say that Anonymous's pro procedures for decision making are perfect or are, are, you know, the best. But I think that the point is, is they're working on an alternative model that maybe will be really good. And a lot of good things have come out of this and we've seen them. So, um, yes, yeah, some really bad things have happened or will happen and things that we don't agree with. But I, th I think that's part of life and um, I really don't think it could get much worse for many of the people in prison for marijuana possession, so. Yeah. You know, I wanna jump in for a second because uh, someone, you know, there's parts of Anonymous I really do admire, but I do think it's important 
uh, not to either put them on a pedestal and be like, they are our democratic future. And in fact, um, you know, there's many cabals in Anonymous. There's a lots of problems. There's lots of poolings of power. There's a lots of secrecy. It's a kind of really, really difficult entity to, to understand. Um, this doesn't mean either that we need to demonize them. And then there's also some really, really good lessons that lie in Anonymous. And it's everything from the fact that they've tapped into this deep disenchantment with the status quo. Um, it is a place that allows the many to participate, which is what Mercedes has pointed to. They perform the importance of anonymity at the moment when anonymity seems dead, right? So I think it's important to, to specify why they're politically valuable in such a way that then doesn't portray them as the thing that's going to solve all democratic problems or political problems. I hate to do this, but we have to, uh, I've been given the notice that we're done for now. We're in this room, although the panelists are going to be open for more questions in one of the smaller rooms to the side. But uh, let's go ahead and give everyone a nice round of applause. Thank you guys so much. Here's our Twitter handles. And in true anonymous fashion, as Before you leave, you leave we'll have a, please show tits. <laughs> we want to play a little sax roll for you on the way out. Yeah.